gozar If you ask me to describe my dad in a few words, I will never stop. <laughs> he has taught me too many things. He taught me too many things. He taught me compassion. He taught me to be patient. He taught me to be still. Uh, he taught me to appreciate life. I used to take pictures of him all the time and he would be like, Oh my God, show me. Do I look good? Put them on Facebook. Put them on Instagram. What do people say? And I remember always my friends um, going to La Panaria and He'll be like, oh, take a picture so you can send it to Sandra. Everything he did, he did it with passion. 
like everything. And that's why he taught us to be, to go into something always with your heart on your sleeve, always. And he was always so proud of like his daughter, his kids, and everyone's like, oh my God, your dad's always talking about you wherever he is. And I think he told us to be a better person. That's the main thing, is um, a teacher. My friend, I miss him a lot. Mommy, mommy. He, when he started getting sick, my mum said, I don't think you should come yet. And then on Tuesday morning, um, I was given birth. Uh, I went into labour at 10.30. Valentina was born at 12.30. And at the same time, they were taking my dad to the hospital in that, that morning. And the first thing was like, I have to tell my mum and dad how painful this is and like how grateful I am that they had me. And, um, and when I started, um, we did a video call just before they put him into um, induced coma. The doctor said to him, I'm sorry, you are positive. We need to put you in sleep. And he said, no, you are not putting me in sleep yet because my grandson is born today. He knew it. And, and the doctor say, you could die. He said, I don't care. I want to see him before sleep. When the video came, he saw us in the video. I got a screenshot. He with Max giving, he, his hand is like this. He was given a blessing. And his face was a tear. I know he's going, he knew he was going. Valentina was crying a lot. So he was like, oh my God, I could hear him. His lungs are really strong. And so we, I, I don't know why, I just thought, let me do a screenshot. And I said, oh my dad, dad, I have, we have the same pajamas. We're in hospital together, like, just to give him a laugh. And then um, George was with him in the hospital and he said, oh, we have to, he, like, they have to take him. And I felt like, oh my God, could this be the last time? He said, said the doctors, I'm ready. My job is done. My mom put the head down. And my dad say, even if I'm going, I'm not going. I prefer going first than see you going. That's why his phrase. He say, my circle in life is done when my baby born. That's what he said. Look, you always said, um, they promise us to be born, they promise us to be happy, they promise us we have challenges, but they never tell us how the end will be. And nobody's asking you to be ready now, but just know that that day might come and everybody might go at some point. So live your life to the fullest. So the dream was that they came to visit me with Libby and Valentina and that they had a present for me. And then um, I said, oh my God, what is it? And then behind them, it was my dad. And then I said, dad, where have you been? Like, we've been crying for you for months. You, you, apparently you left us. And then he grabbed me and he said, I've never, I've never left. I'm always here. But I know he's here with me because in every action that I'm taking, I'm consciously going there, wanting him to be proud of me, you know, and that's, that's my drive now. And now, the same way he inspired a thousand people, a million people, I would try to do the same. And I'm not gonna let this experience define me. I'm just gonna make 
make the best to make him proud because everything that I do, I do, I do for him. Eso, lo aprendí por mi papá, por la vida, como dijo Maranta, por el legado que dejó papá. Sí. Por, el sí. por el positivismo de la familia. Por el positivismo de la familia y por salir adelante. Y por el motor de la casa. Sí, el motor de la casa. El motor de la casa ah, que nos ha enseñado a manejar este dolor. Y nos ha dado toda la fuerza del mundo. Gracias, mamá. Gracias, por ser una guerrera como vos. Gracias a ustedes porque también ustedes me han dado mucha fuerza. Y pa' él. Pa' todo lo que se fueron. Y no se despidieron. Descanso en Santa Paz Y pa' él Pa' todo lo que se fueron Y no se despidieron Descanso en Santa Paz
yo me vine de Colombia por problemas de inseguridad, de la guerrilla, que me iban a matar, pues me vine para acá, para Londres. El mismo día que explotó las bombas aquí en Londres, el 7 del 7 del 2005, yo me senté, se llenó otra vez el tren, cerró la puerta del tren, arrancó el tren e inmediatamente arrancó el tren y se metió al túnel, ahí mismo explotó el tren, ahí estaba yo. Yo no sé Dios para qué me tendrá a mí. Yo era una de las personas que no creía del COVID. Yo decía que la gente estaba mintiendo. Y al, desde que yo llegué al hospital, yo me acuerdo cuando me llevaron al hospital. El hijo mío me acompañó. De ahí, de adelante, yo ya no me acuerdo de nada más. El sueño que yo viví fue de que había una persona que era el, para mí era el diablo. Representado en una señora, una señora pequeña, con la cara toda rasgada, los dientes todos podridos. Esa señora era la que comandaba en la sala de cuidados intensivos. Ella, ella prácticamente, ella no hablaba, ella señalaba y hacía así. Ella colocaba, miraba, chuzaba a la persona y le hacía así, que esa era la que, que se tenía que morir. Yo mismo veía cuando la gente se moría hasta los 33, 35 días que, que vine a despertar y yo nunca he tenido barba y cuando yo desperté toda la cara era llena de pelo con barba, las uñas eran grandes, la piel mía era blanca, era blanca, blanca, blanca y yo era, perdí 22 kilos de peso en los 33 días en el hospital. Uno sale, cuando uno sale para una batalla, uno sale bien limpio, uno sale lleno de fuerza y vamos para la batalla. Cuando uno regresa y sale victorioso, uno viene con nuevas expectativas. Mejor dicho, yo es la esposa. Yo siempre, desde el día que yo salí del hospital, no podía caminar. Me dijeron, Fabián, usted si quiere salir de ese hospital, le tiene que demostrar a los terapeutas que usted está caminando. Me puse a hacer ejercicio y salí caminando. Pues sí, yo me siento, yo me siento como me dijeron los médicos ahí, Fabián, usted es muy, muy, muy lucky, usted es muy de buena. A usted le colocábamos en el cuarto de cuidado de intención donde usted estaba, habían 12, 13 personas y todos se morían. Y usted vivo. Y le metíamos otras personas y se morían y usted ahí vivo. O sea que, pues, me siento muy victorioso. Ok, esta painting es sobre el tri, you ¿no? Know? Y Pachamama, Pacha es meaning, you know, planet o earth. And this all this is belong to the indigenous uh, tradition and in indigenous culture. You see the quipus, you see the you know the chilies, you go the coca leaf, you go the the corn, you go you know the puma, you go the condor, you go animals and this symbol is about chacana, you know, which is a bridge between the the earth and the skies. And you see the flag which is belong to the Peruvian or the Native American, you know. It's about nature. We are coming from nature. You know, when you are in the situation, you notice clear the oxygen. You need oxygen to respire. You need water. So that very strong in my mind. You know, to you have to do something in society about nature and national health service. I, I was in a hospital between 20 or 25 days. Yeah. And you, in your mind, you, you, you feel or you dreaming, or something in your mind that the reality is no, no clear. But they started to shouting, "Who, who died in that moment?" No. So I was, I was, I was waiting. Who, you know, who is dying? Suddenly they, they shouting my name. That I was passed away. I said, "What? What? I'm already dead." I said. I was, but I, I move. I try to move my legs. I'm, I'm still alive. Why these people think that I'm, I'm dead? 
pa a bo sin je bo ma dotar, pa nos moj familji, no. Ma familji, ma dotar, ma malari, no. Se si importan familji, piko se ki bi de de strong belief da you have to live for them as well. I said to to myself, this is not time to die. So you need to fight all the way. You have to go to the challenge. You have to defeat this this disease. You cannot be depressed and that way. You have to be positive all the time. That's in my, my, my view, you know, when I was in, in the hospital.
Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. you've got to come yeah. in with something strong. <laughs> Can we just, have we got time? Okay, let's just do that. There's a really vibrant music community playing, playing Latin music in London and I work with a lot of musicians in that community. I also, work, I also met and started playing with a lot of Congolese musicians and I put a band together which was a mixture of, of Congolese and Latin musicians because there's so many similarities between the music but we lived in completely different worlds in London so I put this band together and we've been going now for like 14 years and it's this great band which brings together uh, Latin and African musicians. All musicians know that over the last 10 years or so there's been less and less opportunity for live music anyway but obviously with COVID-19 and the complete stop of all live music that was added another dimension which was really really drastic. <laughs> Even within the musicians, what I've noticed is that the people who were already, to some extent, marginalised in society are further, are further marginalised. And, I mean, I feel very honoured to work with all these amazing Latin and African musicians, a lot of people who were immigrants into this country. And a lot of those people are really the hardest hit by this crisis and are in a really, really, really difficult position and they've been completely um, many people have fallen through the cracks. After, four, after 14 years, we went to the tribunal court. So there I, I won the process and they, they gave me uh, the stay to live in the UK because the time they giving me uh, a right to, to work in England, to live in England, and the COVID-19 comes and it stops uh, all we were doing, like gigs. We were, we've been playing, we played a lot of festivals in the past in England, but now there's nothing. And for people like me, for example, I'm not entitled to any help, any benefit. I can't live with uh, the friend because uh, I have no uh, income to support or to contribute. So I have to struggle to survive. I mean, I, what I think is one of the most ridiculous things at the beginning of the whole COVID thing was when I think it was Boris Johnson probably said, it's a great leveller, you know, and we're all the same. Actually, I, what I think this whole crisis has done has actually made the divides in society even wider. El día que me asaltaron, me afrenté, me opuse a los dos asaltantes. Y me hirieron con una arma. Eso fue, me dijo mi mamá que ella me decía que me mandaba para, para otro país. Sí, cuando estuve bajo el COVID, yo intenté buscar trabajo en los primeros meses, pero me, me decían que, que todo estaba cerrado. Entonces eso me, me desesperaba un poco. Yo dejé salir a la calle sin rumbo, a ver que si me caía algún trabajo del cielo, como dicen. Porque también a veces pasaba días sin comer. Estaba preocupado de cómo pagar la renta. Era muy difícil esa situación porque yo había escuchado o me habían dicho en las noticias que el primer ministro no podía, dijo que nadie podía echar a nadie a la calle por la situación de, de que estaba pasando. Pero mis caseros me decían, eso no está aprobado, eso es mentira. Acomodaron todas las personas que tenía deuda con ellos, los movieron a una casa más barata, pero ya no éramos dos personas o tres personas en la habitación. Yo vivía con tres personas más, éramos cuatro personas en una habitación. Es una habitación pequeña que pues, a, a, apenas caminaba. Entonces ellos aprovechaban cada situación o cada parte vulnerable de las personas que estaban ahí. 
Ah, tú estás aquí, ya sé cómo está su, tu, tu, situación, tu situación legal. Ya sé cómo está su situación. Entonces ellos atacan por eso. No, si no pagas, vas para la calle. Ah. O ellos lo que hacen, si tú te vas debiéndole algo, ellos miran qué tienes de valor en tu habitación y te lo quitan. Pero ellos quieren que uno esté al día pagándoles, pagándoles, pero ellos no, no, ellos no, no te dicen, teníamos trabajo, vente. Y ellos son trabajos que son a veces mal pagados. Porque a mí, yo tengo trabajo con ellos, trabajo, le voy a hacer algo. Y me dice, te voy a descontar 10 libras porque el trabajo, el trabajo fue muy suave. No, no, me están descontando con el trabajo porque a veces trabajaba más de 8 horas y solo me reconocían las 8 horas. No me pagaban las demás horas. Entonces sí, sí hay gente que explota a los latinos aquí. Estoy, estoy como la mayoría de latinos, ilegal. Entonces, eso fue también que afectaba un poco la parte del COVID. No podía acceder al Universal Credit. Entonces, era algo muy difícil para alguien que sale de un país, como siendo los países latinoamericanos, llegar y no tener algo. Hubo uno que se siente orgulloso, por esto luché, por esto me fui. Por esto di sudor a otras personas. Necesito superarme en este país, no quiero estar así. Volver a mi país y tener algo. Y sentirme orgulloso de que sí vine a aprovechar este país de oportunidades y no me fui con la mano vacía.
My name is Yoshi, Yoshi Bunts. I've been uh, a nurse for over 30 years. So I love my job so much. The only thing I could compare perhaps to COVID is when I was, a, I sort of became a student nurse in Peru when I was only 14, 15 years old. And at that time, I would never forget is, uh, starting my nursing in this hospital where it was the first case recorded of HIV in South America. Nobody heard of HIV before, and, and that was the first case recorded, and I was working in this very, in this sort of, um, this hospital where basically was nothing how to treat anybody. I think of it, the COVID-19 has, um, has completely changed how much we take things for granted. I think people, who doesn't think this is real. It is very real. It, it is unbelievably real. The amount of people that I've seen dying in our hands and, you know, it, it's just phrases where I want to say good, bye, good night instead of goodbye. And, you know, I just want to make sure that she knows that I love them uh, or, you know, I just want, I would just want to see her face one last time and, Oh, it, all those phrases stayed with us so, so much. I think the most difficult has been not being able to put the oxygen on patients who were, you know, where they were dying because we didn't have the right equipment. We didn't have enough equipment. Um, we, ha we had so many patients coming in and we were looking for um, oxygen cylinders. 
I used to run around that hospital two or three o'clock in the morning, running, running, running from a and &E to ICU, begging for for a tank of oxygen, for a for a, a mouthpiece, and I knew where everything was and trying to look in the most secluded areas, trying to find a tank of cylinder. You would never find it and you would know, you would know in your heart that that patient will not survive. And to me that, I think that was the hardest part. Um, patients that will be on these couches for hours and hours and hours, you will start your shift about 7.15 in the morning and that patient will still be there by the time you left the hospital that will about just before eight o'clock in the evening and you knew. Um, you wouldn't really, I think to me the hardest thing is I wanted to ask in the morning what would hap what had happened to that patient but I, and that's one thing I never, I was never strong enough to do, to ask because I knew it will affect me for not doing my a thousand percent and it was nothing else you could do. To me, I think I, f I felt angry because we were we were doing so much work and yet we didn't have the support or the help we needed. And I think for that, having experienced the loss through the whole time, experienced the loss of. Uh, two really lovely close colleagues, a doctor and uh, an amazing sort of uh, uh, porter died because we didn't have the right equipment. He should have been always transferring patients with gloves, with apron, with face masks, with everything. He didn't have anything. He didn't have anything. I started sort of uh, getting it from here, these disposable pillowcases, and I took them with me in a and &E. And I said to the girls, just cut him in the middle, do a triangle, put it in your head. And everybody did that. Everybody did that. And everybody was quite happy with that. I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified. And I would never forget that fright and my heart every time it's like when you go to a plane and the plane goes on a on a sort of a, on a turbulence and your stomach feels really weird it felt all the time like that I got colleagues that even now they have problems with their stomach because of the stress and and I think everybody was affected one way or another but it was just the fear I think my sense of um, camaraderie and my sense of it's just your sense of duty your sense of your your job you you do it you don't think much of the consequences you just work but not because really we wanted to feel we didn't feel appreciated the Thursdays clapping stopped okay until now you're appreciated now you go back to work I don't think I'll be able to do as many hours and as many shifts that I did at the beginning of the year because now is the point where I know people are not taking it seriously. Is my life worth to risk it for people who don't think more other than themselves? But again, COVID, the COVID-19 has taught us so much. Um, we were just nurses and people said, no, you were not just nurses. But to me it was my, it was just I could not be without going to A&E every night. If I could have more extra days in my day, I would. I would just. I will just do it. As a South American, I think is just something that we are very good at being at masquerading things. Um, we are very good at forgetting for a moment. I would start making this little heart shape in felt, and it says, "We are NHS." And I made hundreds and hundreds of them. Every time I had a, just even half an hour, I would be cutting at the house. It was probably my therapy, my sort of uh, trying to forget or something. And it became quite popular. Uh, lots of people, lots of paramedics, ambulance people will come to A&E to ask for one 
heart-shaped say we are NHS and that was the most amazing thing people coming from Charing Cross Hospital, St Thomas Hospital asking the little nurse that makes these heart shapes <laughs> and everybody had a picture with me it's like oh it's the best thing ever <laughs> the best feeling ever <laughs>
survive to endless nights, long rituals made of walks, familiar faces behind the window soothing the loneliness. Survive the day without futile battles against fear, singing abrachame on balconies, thousands of windows open in unison. Resistiremos. Survive together with bodies separated by invisible frames that are nothing more than meters of distances. Survive with news from distant lands and barrios with common stops, aroma of carbonada, tortillas, polenta, locro, sancocho, jacalagua. Survive in houses with unsealed doors, in rooms with walls not as enclosures but as a surface that holds. Survive inside, remembering us alive, dreaming of intertwined crowds without masks. <laughs> Wednesday afternoon. Was it last week this whole thing began? We've lost count. Where is home now? Here by the sea we cannot touch. Or there? I don't know. Rain, gales, hail, the lot in one day, freezing Sunday, the sea yellow, churned. Which day is today? How long were we in lockdown? Outside, early spring. None came yesterday, or the day before, just us, behind these old doors. and skies opened up and we went out breathe pure air like in an old dream It is not the virus nor the confinement, nor the explosive moments at home, which are few, nor lacking the gatherings with poet friends, nor having missed celebrating with my family in Mexico a birthday that wanted to be special. It is not the lack of museums or eating out, nor the summer marking which was large, nor the masks, nor avoiding people on the sidewalk, nor my back pain, nor my dry eyes, nor the feeling that work brims over my days and overflows. It's the murder women, the abused children, the lack of shelter, the impunity which doesn't need the streets. It's the streets on fire, from racist policing, from racism, period. The manipulations, the prejudices that inflame, the hostility to migrants around these parts, the eugenics, cl classism, oscurantism, 
state repression and the emperors. It is greed that sets the tone and its governments who kill communities and create chaos. The virus only comes to crown it all. These are the pandemics. These are the pandemics that are killing us.
Argentina quien volvió En Yellow se escapa de la uni, es que no quiere estudiar Me mandan la ubi que la vaya a buscar No creen que ella es santa, pero es cri criminal Literal, es una loquita, pero sabe lo que hace Tranquilita en baja, igual todos la conocen Tiene detrás de ella todos los gatos de la clase Pero cuando sale después de las 12 Rompe, rompe, en yellow Rompe, la nenita no tiene cumpe En frontera ya tiene con qué Marea con ese bombe y cuando rompe, rompe, rompe. La nenita no tiene cumpe. Te marea con ese bombe. Te frontea ya tiene con que y cuando rompe. Tú, tú eres la Bonnie de mi clay, contigo me siento high. La pillé por el Instagram y le dije hi. Soy el nene, el blanquito que más flow tiene. Dame solo una hora y te aseguro que te tiene. Porque tengo el estilo que suena de pinga pa' toda la muñeca. Y si me la encuentro ahora, estoy seguro que ella peca. Le mete tantas horas al jean que parece un atleta. Y cuando le dan tapado, ella en toda la discoteca. Rompe, la nenita no tiene culpa. Te marea, ya tiene con qué. Te frontea con ese bombi cuando rompe, rompe. Pegadito vamos a bailar. En la disco vamos a rumbear, ay mamá. En la disco vamos a bailar. Pegadito vamos a rumbear. En la disco vamos a gozar. Pegadito vamos a rumbear, ay mamá. Step to the front, step to the back. Baby girl, you know I love it like that. Mueve la cadera, va de aquí para allá. El ritmo lo controlo, no lo voy a parar. Step to the front, step to the back. Baby girl, you know I love it like that. Mueve la cadera, va de aquí para allá. El ritmo lo controlo, no lo voy a parar. Zumba latina, que la noche está buena. Vamos a bailar hasta la luna llena. Zumba de fe, voy un caballito. Ven, escucha todo lo que he escrito. Yo bailo hip hop como Snoop Dogg. Y hago salsa hasta como Tito. Pegadito, bien pegadito. Una vuelta, un meneíto. Te conquisto hasta con cautela. Algo exótico, candy de Venezuela. Carne asada de Puerto Rico. Mira, ma, ay, qué rico. Qué rico, mira, ma, ay, qué rico. Qué rico, mira, ma, ay, qué rico. En la disco vamos a bailar. En la disco vamos a rumbear. Ay, mamá. Pegadito vamos a bailar. Vamos a rumbear, ay mamá Merengue, hip hop a los fulanitos En la vieja escuela los tiempos de bico Sí, 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 menealo así Sí, sí, guau Tu belleza es un delito Ni si quieres más ni un besito Solo dime que todo está rico Pegadito, pe, pegadito Unos tres pasos en el piso En la casa blusa le quito No te dejo, no soy ese tipo Eres cuarenta sonando en el equipo Vestido rojo Entró la diabla, cuida te roba, te roba el alma, lo llevamos suave con calma. A tu amiga te digo mi pana, bailemos hasta mañana, bailemos hasta mañana, na, 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 na. Cuando yo he tenido conocimiento de, de esta fundación, eh, me ha parecido algo magnífico, pues porque no abundan las fundaciones aquí. Y más para la comunidad latina, que nos ayuda a integrarnos, a, a no sentirnos tan solos. De saber que tenemos alguien con quien podemos contar, desinteresadamente y de corazón. Eh, 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 no es fácil, ¿sabes? Porque aquí la inmensa mayoría de latinos tienen a su mamá, o viven con sus hermanos, o su esposa, ¿sabes? Y es diferente. Tú estás en un país extraño. Dime tú, una latina, donde la gente no se presta muchas veces ni para un saludo. Nosotros tenemos una cultura de, de saludar hasta el que no conocemos, ¿sabes? Estoy pasando por una depresión, pero por eso, por la soledad, por, por estar uno solo. Y yo vengo aquí y me siento fantástico por, porque 
tengo mis amigas que me he hecho aquí, mi gente conocida, y puedo intercambiar ideas con ellos, hablar, me entretengo un rato y ya está. Uh, the idea was um, to help to tackle loneliness and isolation. Obviously, the COVID-19 was affecting everyone. In this small community, the Latin American community, many people work in hospitality, and um, we had to make decisions in terms of contacting them, uh, basically adapting the way we were running the activities uh, and start uh, developing an emergency plan, uh, delivering food parcels and toiletries. The whole world is round, and in order for us to help each other, we need to go hand in hand. And if everybody goes hand in hand, we can actually go around the world. By the time I heard about Lava Group, I had suffered severe mental health. I decided to research to find how could I help myself rather than continuing taking medication. Uh, with organizations such as Lawa, uh, the strong emphasis that we have or that they have on, on creating a community in order to support or that they support each other um, is what has kind of enabled or allowed them to, to be supported during the pandemic. We started to do IT classes, kind of calling women and um, trying to find different ways of uh, helping them to like download Zoom. For a lot of women who haven't had access to these devices before, it was a bit of a challenge. Um, because I think a lot of um, and I think, you know, it's been talked about a lot of mental health problems have stemmed from this, um, particularly for women, um, elderly women, for example, who didn't, couldn't even leave the house. So having the ability to use Zoom, for example, was really quite incredible for them to join activities and do things that weren't just lying in bed. When the lockdown started, that was a completely new experience for me. So it was a very good experience to share and to be able to share through technology, which I think it was something new for everyone. So weeks went by and uh, that was a way. We even celebrated birthdays or whatever came through. I think if I haven't been in the group, I don't think, mentally, I don't think I could have survived. Um, being able to call anyone, being able to share things, the pain. Uh, I didn't tell anyone about my illness, only Mercedes. It's like vitamin to, to live. Yeah, so I think in general just not having family for me in the UK has been quite difficult to deal with. I think that has kind of kept me going because I do really enjoy helping, but also maintaining that connection also really helps me. Uh, what I learned about all this lockdown, the importance of uh, uh, fraternity, of being together, generosity, of being with people, the relatives, with those you love thinking of taking advantage of every moment you, you, you have because you realize there you were isolated, you couldn't see them and you didn't know whether you were going to see them again, you know, with all the people. So I think that was a great experience and how important it is to keep in touch with your friends and, and appreciate life more, you know, to make uh, every day the best of every day as if it was the last one.
Como é que tá é, sua pelva aqui? Esquenta bastante. Esquenta é. bastante na bola. I started the cir cir círculo maternar no UK. And the group came because um, I basically, I, I, I guess I feel sad and sorry when I start to hear the, the, the experience of like Brazilian women giving birth and in the UK and the difference between our systems, basically related to natural birth and how much Brazilian women can fear natural birth and how they can compare our systems, like Brazil it is, I think it still is one of the highest, where we have the highest rate of cesarean and when you compare with all the countries in the world. I would say everything becomes pretty much medicalized over, over the years, health insurance, cor corruption, government, everything becomes, in my opinion, it's, it's a good business. You know, when it comes to cesarean, you book the day, the time, And if I just do this quick and dirty in 20 minutes, I can go back to my private practice or I can go and do another C-section at a private hospital and I'm going to be making much more money than just staying here and supporting you through your natural vaginal birth because you don't know how long that's going to take. We start, to, we start the group just to share information, to help them to understand the system and to help them to understand that nobody's trying to force them to have natural birth and it's actually a natural and wonderful way to give birth. <laughs> and, and during the COVID, When, when basically when, when, when you go in labor and you have to go to the hospital, the first thing that happens there is you have to pass through triage and not even your partner, your husband or your wife can, can be in the triage with you and then they immediately become very vulnerable and they, they can go blank, you know, they're busy with their body, they are laboring and then they have to go to triage with someone that they never saw in their life and English is not their first language, so they immediately become even more vulnerable. The whole thing seemed very daunting, uh, like just during COVID times to do that by yourself. There is this whole interaction that you just lose. Women are, are losing a lot in that sense of um, human contact because it's very important. Like, to, I mean, they needed the support and I was I would feel really sorry for them, really bad for them because that choice was taken away from them and this will happen because if you're lonely, you're scared, um, if there is an emergency, you have 10 people in the room, they're all strangers to you and they're all doing things to you, no hand to hold, you know, to look at you and say it's okay, they're taking care of the situation and um, I look at the woman and I say, breathe, let's breathe. You do it with her, and right? you do it with her, and that regulates. You know, it it does help her to concentrate and and, and to, to you know, yeah, to just um, be in that calm space again. You know, uh, and so with the mask, you can't do that <laughs> because she can't see half of your face. She can see your eyes. So I found that really, really challenging. And, and the good thing about it is just then we start to have more home birth, which actually Brazilian women would never consider. Like just, it's just not a choice. It's not something that they will look into it. Well, when I told my mom and my sister actually about um, deciding to go for a home birth, uh, there was a lot of apprehension to put it mildly. Uh, I wanted to be in my safe place with the people I feel protected uh, around me, uh, with people that I actually trust. And if it is someone you've been working with together and you have people you trust and they actually know you. So, I mean, it gives me a lot of comfort having my mom and my husband nearby women, women who were having home birth it went up quite a bit like i think two or three percent more women uh, had a home birth because 
and because they were worried about going to the hospital. They changed completely. It was like they wanted a cesarean section and they changed the home birth. Uh, so it was a good thing, a positive thing, I guess, from COVID. And also having the birth partner because in hospital it's still very restricted. Um, I think this has been like a very personal but educated decision. Estás a mi lado, será que perdí la conciencia. 